Okay, so um, where we were at was uh, the last time we were um, with John the Baptist, he was uh, doing his baptism, and the crowds were coming to him. I remember the religious leaders, the Sadducees and Pharisees also came, but they didn't come to be baptized, they just come to witness, because they were in the, the first stage of interrogation, right? Or the, 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 the first stage, which was, not, uh, sorry, the first stage is observation. And they were coming there just to observe. And so the people that are coming and they're going to, they're asking some questions. Like they're actually coming to be baptized. They believe John's message. And then they want to know, John, what, what do we have to do? What do we have to repent of? So John kind of gives us uh, some information here. And, and as he's talking about what will happen, I just go back a few slides here on this, if I can get this to work. We go back just a few uh, slides here is that um, there are basically John is uh, John is saying that uh, Jesus is going to um, baptize uh, in fire. John's going to baptize in water and Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit with fire. And so we're going to kind of get into that now where John's going to talk about, well, what happens to those who don't uh repent and follow so this is we're kind of coming back into the middle of where we were last week and this is what it says in matthew three ten. so john says even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire okay so john's saying hey those who refuse to repent those who refuse to accept the message will be cut down and thrown into the fire right now, cut down, you know what happens to a, 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 a tree or some sort of a, a plant that you cut down and you throw in the fire? It's dead and it burns completely up, all right? So John is saying right here, this is what is going to happen to those people who are going to do not repent. They will actually be thrown into the fire and they will experience their destruction and their complete punishment, all right? We'll get to... He'll repeat this a little bit later on here. So there's a warning to that. Now, he's kind of given that warning there. And now we get to these three groups of people that say, okay, John, um, we want to repent. We're here for the baptism. We want to be baptized by you. What, what, is that, what does that mean specifically for us? What do we need to do to change so that we are ready and prepared for the Messiah when the Messiah comes? So it says in Luke 3, 10 through 14, it says, And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. So the first group is the general population is asking him. And what he says to them is that, hey, do what is required in the second greatest commandment, which is what? First greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So John's basically just reflecting on that. Like the whole of the Mosaic law, the whole of righteousness can be summed up in those two. And he's just saying, take care of your, your fellow person. Their need, take care of them. That's actually what you need to do. Our tendency, of course, is to hoard the things that we have and not to share them. So that was the first thing. He says, look, act in a righteous manner, right, to others. Okay. Whoa, Rich. Hey, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you in Yes. Yes, I am. And by the way, I'm recording, so we'll get to that here after we're, we're done here. All right. Um, the second group of people, though, that ask him what they should do are the tax collectors or the publicans. So it says tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Now, these tax collectors, which are, are they're called publicans. So remember when he's, he's accused, like your, uh, the religious leaders come up to his disciples and say, why does your master eat with public, uh, publicans and sinners? He's talking about tax collectors, right? That's what they were. They were pub public representatives, tax collectors. If they did it yesterday and today, then they would be three publicans. Jeez, right? <laughs> okay, great. Okay, that's not good. That's good. That's a good joke. Good joke. So the, so the uh, yes, the tax collectors are told to extort no more. In other words, what John says is collect no more than you're authorized to do. Now, 
it's interesting that if you were one of the religious leaders, particularly the Pharisees, because remember the Zealots were a part of the Pharisaic party, the Pharisaic party. They were the, the ultra right wing of the Pharisaic party, and they did not believe in Rome's authority over the Jewish people. And so they were the ones that wanted to, to kill the Romans and, and, and get them out. So John says something here. So if you imagine these Pharisees are standing here listening to John, what do you think they think John should say in response to the tax collectors? If he's going to tell them what righteousness is, what do you think they would they, they, they would expect him to say? Rebuke them. That's right, rebuke them. Rebuke them. Call, yeah. them, call them a brood of vipers. Yeah, D don't stop being a tax collector. You, what you would expect him there. And all of a sudden, John doesn't say that. John doesn't say anything about that. And I imagine they're probably like aghast at, can you believe what he just said? He didn't tell them to stop being those wicked people. He just said, do your job. Well, oh yeah, yes, yeah. so that's what they would say. Is stop, yeah, stop, stop being, being a representative of Rome. That's right. Stop being a representative of, of Rome is probably what they'd say. But notice John doesn't say that. He just says, do your job. Right, because the Bible says that God has created government. Government is a godly institution. Now, governments don't act the way that they should most of the time, but God instituted the governmental system to govern humanity, right? And so God is not against paying taxes. So as much of us don't like to pay taxes, and we can gripe about how much taxes we pay and whatever else, it's totally fine. But notice John doesn't say anything about that. Hey, if you're a tax collector, only collect what Rome has authorized you to collect. And don't extort more, because when you're extorting more, you're stealing from your fellow Jews. They're already under the burden that Rome has put on them. Don't then be greedy yourself, okay? Now, the reason that John tells him this, and, and of course, when he tells him not to extort more, his command goes against the very reason why they took the job in the first place, okay? So, this is what uh, Arnold says, Arnold Fruchtemami says, uh, the reason someone became a tax collector was not because the job paid well, but because of what Rome allowed them to get away with. If the Roman authorities decided that a person owed the government five shekels in taxes, the publican would collect 10, give five to Rome, and keep five for himself. Publicans became wealthy by extorting from their own people. In Greek, these head tax collectors were called architelonis. Uh, the tax collectors under them were called uh, Telonai, most of whom were Jews. The Architelonis farmed out their territory to the Telonai. In other words, these, these Romans tax collectors would farm out their area to these individual Jews, playing the role of the uh, Telonai, who in order to make a profit inflated the amount to be collected. Those, uh, those whose business forced them to travel had to pay taxes every time they entered a new region or territory. This and the fact that Rome did not prevent Arbitrariness and abuse of power led to Judaism reacting with extreme distaste to those who took up this vocation, right? So go ahead, be a tax collector. Just don't collect more than what Rome has authorized you to do, right? That's what he's telling them, okay? The next group is, and I, I see I've got this, the yellow highlight is on the wrong part here. The next group are soldiers. It says, soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages, right? So again, he's telling them to be content with what they're being paid as a soldier, which wasn't very much at all, right? Um, so these soldiers weren't Roman soldiers. These soldiers were Jewish soldiers that were high, they, they were paid is sort of hired mercenaries for the Roman Empire, right? Rome, you know, as far as the number of people that the Roman Empire, that were true Romans, was not as was not significant enough to basically occupy all their territory. So they had Germans and all, I mean, they had all kinds of them. Not, they weren't called Germans back then, but, you know, Germanic tribes, and they had people from different areas that they would conscript into their army and pay them. Well, that would happen here in Israel as well. They would pay Jewish people to be part of that Roman army. And so um, what, he, what uh, Brutumam says about this, he said they had occupying authority, these, these Jewish um, soldiers, meaning they were assigned to an occupied people. Then they could do what was forbidden under Mosaic law. They could exact things from the occupied people and commit acts of violence, forcing their victims to do things they wished not to do. Thus, these Jewish soldiers 
could supplement their income, right? So in other words, being a soldier didn't pay very well. But because you had a power and authority, they were able to abuse that and force people. You don't do this, guess what? We're going to make accusations. We're going to arrest you, beat you up. But what are the, I mean, they have the power to do that. And they were abusing that to extort money from people to supplement their income. Okay. So again, he's telling them to do the exact opposite of the reason why he became a soldier to begin with. I mean, there's no reason for me to join the Roman army if I'm not going to be able to use that power to my own advantage. Right. So that's what he's saying here. Now, when he asked them, collect no more than your authorized, uh, sorry, um, don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, but be content with your wages, right? So this term here for the wages, the exhortation is to be content with one's wage. And that is, uh, in Greek, it's uh, apsonion, is almost exclusively a military term for the provisions given to a soldier. The military wage of that day was a basic provision of food and minimal subsistence, a level of support that might tempt one to take advantage of position and to supplement income through excessive use of civil authority. If one was content, then one would be less tempted by this possibility, right? So you have John, when people are asking, well, what should I do? How, what do I need to do to act righteously? John just says, go against your desires of the human flesh, right? To hoard your own wealth, to use your position and, a, and of authority and power to essentially rob your own people blind, right? Stop doing those things that are unrighteous. Now, the religious leaders, again, they're watching this, right? They've already been called out by John. He's called them a brood of vipers. They've been listening and watching to what these people have said. They've heard the message that John has proclaimed. Remember, this is the first stage of observation where the, the Sanhedrin, the, religion, the ruling body in Jerusalem, has sent out this delegation to John's baptism to find out if his baptism, his movement is significant. If it is a significant messianic movement, they're to come back and tell the Sanhedrin that, in fact, that is the case. So when they go back, this delegation goes back to the Sanhedrin, here's the types of things that they would be reporting. Number one, John is calling people to repent of their sins, to live a righteous and holy life. But guess what? He didn't call out all the things that we would have called out. Like he's telling them to do things that wouldn't have been on our priority list. In fact, he didn't even call them out for these other things like he should have, right? So he's, he's calling them to righteousness, but it doesn't match our righteousness. That would have been the first thing, right? Um, this repentance is asking them to do things that are contrary to their, their nature desire, and that the repentance is tied in with the kingdom is coming. So John's telling people to repent because the Messianic kingdom is here, okay? Now, we know that they went back and reported that this first stage of observation that John's ministry was significant because we see them later on come back again. This time, it's the stage of inter interrogation where they actually ask questions. So just imagine here, they're going to leave, they're going to go back, they're going to report back to the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin says, okay, great, this is significant, and we need you to go back now and get a lot more detail, which we'll find out here uh, very shortly. Yes, Joe, hold on here. So what, what's the origin of baptism with the Jews? Did it come out of circumcision? Where did it develop? Out yeah, we'll actually talk about that in just a moment. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, um, so here's something to kind of keep in mind. What happens to the herald, John the Baptist, happens to the king, right? They'll do the same thing. They'll go out. They'll do in a stage of observation to Jesus where they won't say anything, but he'll read their minds and he'll tell them what they're saying and they, they, they don't like that. And then there'll be a stage of interrogation. They will murder the herald. They'll oppose the herald. They will oppose and murder the Messiah. So John and Jesus' ministry sort of parallel each other in a lot of interesting ways um, throughout the biblical accounts. Okay. Now, um, John's going to continue on with his message, okay? Now, his message is going to um, talk about 
what is going to happen here with Christ? What is the difference sort of between their ministries and what is going to happen uh, between that? And some of the stuff is still things that are going to be in the end times. It's still future related. Some of all has already been inaugurated. Some parts of what he's going to say is still left to be completed, right? And we'll see that from the section here. Um, let me let me go ahead and uh, read from Luke. And again, what I've tried to do here is the stuff in yellow are the things that are kind of unique between the different ones, right? So in other words, Luke's the only one that that talks about this, um, you know, so with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Like that's a part that Luke adds that you don't find in Matthew or Mark. All right. Um, Luke says this, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. Okay, so now John's still, he's baptizing, he's talking to people, and people are like, they're still not sure, like, who is he? I mean, we believe your message, many of them, but we're not sure, are you, are you the Christ? Are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Who are you, right? They, they're not sure what to make of John yet. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Right? So... John's still continuing to preach and talk to those who have come to his baptism. All right. The first question that people are kind of asking, it says right here that they were, they were unclear about whether or not he was the Christ. So they're, they're, they're asking that question, and that's the question that's posed. John, are, are you the Messiah? So John's going to set the record straight here about who he is versus who Christ is. Now, it's still not very clear to people that the answer he gives, but he does distinguish himself from Christ, right? And he does that by saying that he who is coming after me, right? That means that I'm not the Messiah. I'm going to be the forerunner because the Messiah comes after the forerunner. So he who comes after me is mightier than I. So again, the forerunner is not mightier than the Messiah. So he's setting that it's straight there that I'm not the one who's coming, who's mightier. I am his forerunner, right? And then he says, um, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, all right? Now, it is so interesting to me that John, his deep reverence and respect. Now, if you think of someone, Jesus calls him the greatest person born in the since the old in, since the old testament period in, until that time now it's, now the new testament saints are going to be greater than john the baptist but up until that time john the baptist is the greatest one born other than the messiah himself so if you are thinking about who can kind of get on their high horse who can kind of trot around and say look who i am john the baptist he's the greatest one born other than christ right and he's the forerunner. Like he's got this preeminent position in history that no one else has up to that point. Did you so, say Christ called him the greatest one born? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Born of the womb. He's the greatest one. Yeah. yeah I did say that. Yes. Do you have a question about that or comment? Uh, what, what would a Catholic believer do, that, do with that when there's Mary was still alive? So is he greater than Mary? Uh, well, John says, it's clear from the text that John says that Christ is greater than he is. So when Christ is saying the greatest one born of the womb, he's obviously not, he's excluding himself from that, right? So other than himself, John the Baptist would be the greatest one, right? Oh, Mary. Oh, uh, oh yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know exactly what they would do, to be honest with you. That one. Yeah. So anyway, but 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 again, what my point here is this is that the person that could have the most claim to fame other than the Messiah is John the Baptist, but yet look at his approach to Christ. And that tells us, like, what is our approach to Christ? 
and I've talked about this a lot. If you come to the uh, the Bible studies that I've done, like I find myself and I find others are really kind of flippant. We get super comfortable with Jesus is my friend, Jesus is my pal, Jesus loves me and saves me, and so he's sort of like the you know that he's like your little buddy, your little like you know your little uh, stuffed animal you bring on with you and just kind of pat. I don't know what's that. He's your lap dog. Jesus is your lap dog, and he just loves you and he licks your face and whatever else. And we fail to recognize that he is God, now, right? Pharisees had that same heart when they came to be baptized because they said, we're of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yep, yeah. So they had that same kind of heart yep. that, uh, that, that we're with them. And you say, well, we're with Jesus. Yeah, but John the Baptist gives us, a, I think, a picture into how we should position ourselves. Yes, we don't approach him in fear. We understand that he loves us. He gives us his grace. But there's also, like, we, we've lost the reverence for who God is, and we've lost the reverence for who Christ is. And John shows us what that reverence looks like. Um, Arnold says this. He says, um, Carrying the master's things, John says that he's not worthy to even untie um, uh, his sandals. He's not worthy um, to carry. It says carrying the master's things before him to the bathhouse and taking off his shoes when he comes home are always tied together in the Talmud. That's the Jewish rabbinic writings to illustrate the service of a slave. Furthermore, it was expected that sons and disciples would perform the duties of a slave. So while the disciple was to carry his, his teacher's shoes, he was not expected to take them off. And even if he was a slave, the task of loosening the sandal was beneath a Jew and the act was not to be performed, according to the rabbis. However, Yohanan, which is John, that's his Hebrew name, Yohanan, uh, who is neither a slave nor technically Yeshua's disciple, went further than what would have been the duty of an unfree, in other words, a slave man, and declared himself as not worthy of even the most humiliating task of a slave. In other words, he considered himself not worthy to be that close to the Messiah. What a like, what a stance that John the Baptist takes towards Christ, mm -hmm. right? That we, I think, can learn from. Now, what he says here is he says, um, I'm not him. He's going to come after me. He's mightier than I. And then he distinguishes the two baptisms. John's baptism is not the same baptism that we have as believers, right? It's called believer's baptism, right? John says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and, floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John says, hey, look, I'm going to baptize with water. My baptism is with water. And I'm calling the nation to repentance in preparation for the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. That's my baptism, right? Jesus is going to baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. Now, that fire many times gets misrepresented. People think that that is Pentecost, the fire that came down or whatever else. This is not the fire of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is Pentecost. Fire is the judgment of the wicked in hell, in the lake of fire. And it's pretty clear because John goes on to say that some he's going to gather and he's going to gather his wheat into the barn. That's one group of people, right? Those are the believers. They will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But the chaff, he will burn up in unquenchable fire. These chaff, the unbelievers, are going to experience this fire, right? So Christ will do two types of baptisms. One baptism is for believers, and that's going to be with the Holy Spirit. The second baptism is going to be for unbelievers, and he's going to baptize them with fire. The lake of fire, and they're going to be destroyed. Okay? Yes, did you have a yes, comment, Mike? Yes, or a question. Uh, John says that uh, Jesus will come and uh, baptize in the Holy Spirit. And then um, it says here that uh, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between in and by? Uh, and one, what is baptism? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is uh, well, and again, some will take it as, as being a little more than what I'm going to explain. But here's, my, here's, here's the way that I understand it. In the Old Testament, no believer was had the Holy Spirit residing in them on a permanent basis. The Holy Spirit would come upon a person, and then the Holy Spirit would leave, 
right? That's why David says, don't, uh, do not take your Holy Spirit from me, and which was a real concern because the Holy Spirit would come upon David and the Holy Spirit would leave. And he didn't want his sin to then cause the Holy Spirit to leave him permanently. Now, as a believer, the Holy Spirit does what? Reason exactly. So to be baptized in or with the Holy Spirit is the is, is at least minimally. Now I know there's some that will add to this, but at least minimally, it means upon salvation, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you to empower you to live the Christian life. Renews you. Yeah. Renews. Yes. He's born, renewed, regenerated, regenerated. regenerated. Whereas the unbelievers. They're, they're just cast off and burned like chaff on the week. And he'll never leave or forsake you. Yeah. And it is no longer I who live. Just kidding. Anyone got any more verses they want to spell? This is great. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, this is really good. Okay. So um, anyway, so unbelievers, though, get baptized by this fire. And the, and the word that we have there is this. Um, and of course, that's the lake of fire. I've already said that in Revelation 20. Um. The fire is going to be unquenchable. Okay, now unquenchable in in uh, the Greek is asbestos, right? Asbestos, right? That's where we get the term asbestos from, right? That's why people have asbestos so that fire can't uh, can't consume it. Now, this word here does not mean the fire will never go out. What it means is that the fire will not go out until it has accomplished everything it was designed to do, right? So. It doesn't mean it will never go out. It just means that it cannot be resisted. So actually to be unquenchable means that something cannot be resisted. So if you went to a, a, um, a burning building, like if you're a firefighter and the building was a, like a five alarm fire and it was just a blaze and they just stand back, they put as much water as you can. And what do they do? You just let it burn to the ground because the fire cannot be resisted, but eventually the fire goes out. So this, uh, this idea of unquenchable fire means fire that cannot be quenched from some source. In other words, until that fire has completed its destructive process, it cannot be put out. That's what it means, unquenchable, right? Um, now, the other thing here is that it says that the fire we burned up, the, we'll, we'll burn up the chaff completely, okay? Because what he uses here, he says, we'll burn with unquenchable fire. And the, um, the burn here, is a uh, the Greek word is called uh, katakayo, right? So uh, kayo means to burn. Kata is the intensive of that verb. So when you see katakayo, it doesn't just mean burn, but it means completely to incinerate, incinerate to nothingness, to burn completely without the ability to burn any further, right? So this chaff is going to be thrown in the fire to be burned up absolutely completely, not just semi burn, not just singed but to be burned up completely, right? To burn down. So this is gonna be a destructive process that God is gonna put them through, which is of course, the reason why we need to reach out to people. Like this is not a, uh, this is not the vision of hell that people have like ACDC, I'm on the highway to hell, right? And they're gonna go down there and party and rock and roll, whatever else, no, no. There is a destruction that is waiting for unbelievers. And that is what John says here, Christ, is going to do it. Now, the first part, the baptism with the Spirit, occurred at Pentecost, the beginning of the church. Every believer now during the church age that becomes a believer gets baptized with the Holy Spirit. That has started. What has not yet occurred is the second one, the baptism of fire, which will not will, won't occur until the great white throne judgment, where the wicked are judged based off their deeds and thrown into the lake of fire to be completely burned up, katakayo, in the lake of fire. Okay. All right. It should be disturbing. No, very disturbing. Yeah. I, I'm 100% with you. I mean, it's, in, it's intended to be disturbing, not, not to like shock you, but to just say, look, this is the warning. There are two destinies. One is to be baptized and to be able to live have eternal life the other one is to be completely destroyed for all eternity for a destruction that cannot come you cannot come back from that destruction these are the people who have rejected him yes they haven't not necessarily not heard the message they've flat out rejected him and said i don't, I don't, yep. don't want to have nothing to do with the guy yep 
All right, so so this is uh, this is what Alfred um, Edersheim, who's a great author, uh, he's he's, he's, uh, he's almost a couple of here, a couple hundred years old now. But if you want to read any of the uh, Jewish history stuff or culture stuff, Edersheim is awesome. But this is what he says. He says his baptism uh, baptism would not be preparatory repentance with water, but the divine baptism in the Holy Spirit of fire and the Spirit who sanctified and the divine light which is purified and so effectively qualified for the kingdom. And there was still another contrast. John's was but preparing work. In other words, he was preparing the people to repent for the coming of the Messiah. The Christ, that of final decision, after it came the harvest, his was the harvest and his the garner. His also the fan with which he would sift the wheat from the straw and chaff, the one to be garnered, the other burned with fire. Thus, early in the history of the kingdom of God, was it indicated that Alike that which would prove useless straw and the good corn were inseparably connected in God's harvest field till the reaping time that both belong to him and that the final separation would only come at the last and by his own hand. And what, what Edersheim is saying there is, look, and Christ is even going to say this, during the church age, sometimes it's not going to be really clear who's wheat and who's chaff. When the final accounting comes, though, that's where God is going to, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Chaff's going to burn, the wheat's going to be brought into the barn so in this age we call the church age there's going to be some chaff mixed in in your churches some churches are going to be all chaff in fact right and that's that's uh what is being pointed out here yeah um go ahead uh, hold on here i'm going back to the show i am i apologize that's fine um did you go back to your this one over here no, no, uh, what you just read. Yeah. So the baptism with water, but the divine baptism in the Holy Spirit. When does that happen to uh, a believer? When, when, when you, when you, when you uh, accept Christ, when you're saved at the moment of salvation, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. He comes to reside in you. And I know there are some that will say that it includes other things, but just as a minimum, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you at the moment of salvation. And so at that moment, you don't necessarily have to be baptized. You accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord. Yeah, bat Savior. water baptism does not bring salvation. Water baptism is subsequent to salvation. Yeah. Well, Rich. it just seems that a person might not really understand the significance of that. You know, when you think of baptism by water, right? Because uh you're encouraged to get baptized when you become saved, but to really think what it means to be baptized, like it says in the Holy Spirit, um, I don't know if I really thought about that a whole lot in terms of, you know, what that means because it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the power of God that dwells in. Yeah, here's the good thing about salvation: salvation requires very little knowledge. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, you think about people like to be saved. There's not a lot you need to believe and have faith in to be saved. You don't even have to have your theology right about what happens to me at the moment of conversion. You don't have to have your theology right about what is water baptism. In fact, there's so there's 99% of all the theology that you may eventually learn about later on. You don't have to know any of that to be saved. Um, yes. So yes, Jeff. You know, if, as believers, this can be, you know, a little bit confusing trying to trying to work it out i mean i understand how an unbeliever or a new christian would be uh could 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 completely fail to grasp the significance of your repentance your acceptance of christ as your lord and savior um and and uh being baptized in the spirit which is the lord christ the holy spirit comes inside of you and from there you move forward and maybe, you know, down the road as, as we're commanded as a, as a show of faith and our, and our connection and our unity with Jesus and his uh, uh, death and resurrection, we're baptized in the water, right? But man, the pen, people who say, if you're not speaking in tongues, you're not baptized in the spirit and all this can be so confusing for a new believer. I just don't even, I just, this isn't anything to worry about so much as long as you understand that, uh, uh what what your where your salvation comes from then this baptism of the spirit the baptism of by fire of unbelievers the baptism of the water that'll come to come to pass 
Yeah, I mean, that's the difference between salvation and discipleship. I mean, discipleship is is where you not only bring your will wholly, completely on a sanctification basis under the, the control of the Spirit, but it's also where you are discipled to understand more about God. But salvation, the content of salvation is like super small, right? And there's much you don't understand about what it means to be a believer and that uh, that's great, though, because can you imagine if you had to know correct theology before you could be saved? I mean, the full extent. You have to know the correct theology to be saved. But if you had to know all of the theology in correctly known to be saved, none of us would be saved. We'd, we'd be 90 years old before we finally think we, we've, we've got it right and then commit ourselves to God. So anyway, I, I do have to get going. I'm sorry. Let me just, if I can, just get moving here because I've got so much content to cover between this week and next week. So, all right. Um, all right. So Luke then ends with, it says, uh, so with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. So in other words, um, this is just giving us a summary that this is just a glimpse of what John said. It's not the full amount of what John said. He probably said much more to the people. We get like these little snippets and, and we're like, well, I'm sure he said more. And of course he actually did. What the content of that was, we are not sure. All right. We are now going from the first sort of major section of the life of Christ, which is the introduction to him. So that's his birth and, you know, the genealogies and all that kind of stuff. Now we're actually going to get into the second main section, which is the approval of the king. Christ is now going to come onto the scene. So if you've been waiting to actually, like, learn about the life of the Messiah, it's like, gosh, we've done a whole lot of preparatory work. I haven't seen Christ except at his birth. And one little sentence he made when he was at the temple, and that I haven't heard from the Messiah yet. This is now where we get him coming back onto the scene for his baptism. And so we have this section, the approval of the king by his forerunner and by God himself, right? This is the approval of the king section. And then the next section after that will be the third section will be the authentication of the king by his miracles and things like that. All right. So the approval of the king. Let's start off here with uh, the baptism of Jesus. And um, again, I'm going to read from Matthew here, but you can see some of the differences. Like Luke's the only one that tells us how old Jesus was when he started his ministry, right? So we only get that. If we didn't have Luke, we wouldn't have a clue how, how old Jesus was when he started his ministry. We wouldn't have any idea. 50, 20, no idea. But Luke actually tells us approximately what time that's other than this one verse <laughs> you know luke chapter uh, three verse 23 we wouldn't have any idea all right matthew says this in matthew chapter three okay so john the baptist he's baptizing then jesus boom comes on the scene came from galilee from nazareth to the jordan to john to be baptized by him john would have prevented him saying I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, that being John, consented to baptize him. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my uh, beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the baptism of Christ. The Trinity is here. You're right. We're going to get into that. Okay. Now, someone asked a question earlier about, about baptism. All right. First thing is, is that this one instance marks the demarcation line for Christ. At his baptism, his private life is now over. And his public life now starts. Before this baptism, he was just a normal everyday Joe. I mean, there's some people that would still remember what happened to him. Joe, that's right. Some people remember what happened to him. But for the most part, no one need, he was just the carpenter's son. He just lived in Nazareth, the guy down the road, right? Nice guy, real nice guy, but just a, just a guy. Now this, this is that demarcation line for him. Um, this ritual of baptism, though, sometimes as Christians, we, we, we sort of read back into stuff, and we think that baptism started with John the Baptist, and that isn't true at all. The Jews had been baptizing people for, you know, about 1,400 years at least, 
right? It's, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, right? Because in the Old Testament, the Mosaic law commanded that people be baptized for ceremonial uh, uncleanness, right? Not for sin. If you were ceremonially unclean, if you touched a dead body, if there was, you had an omit, uh, omission, if you, you know, a woman wants, you know, there, there's things that would make you just ceremonially unclean had nothing to do with sin. And in order for you to be ceremonially clean, a lot of times, the Mosaic law would command that in addition to sometimes a sacrifice, sometimes no sacrifice, that you would have to go wash yourself and be baptized in a mikvah to be ceremonial clean. So they've been doing baptism for 1400 years at least. And even before uh, this time of John, they were doing baptism for uh, if you were to be a, a Gentile and you wanted to convert to Judaism, you would be baptized, right? Even if you wanted to, um, some like initiation rites, I'll call them clubs for lack of a better word, but if you, there are certain groups, they might require you to go through an initiation rite of baptism. So this idea of baptism was ingrained in the Jewish people long, long before we ever get to John the Baptist, right? So we don't want to just think of baptism as just being a sort of a Christian thing. This was a Jewish thing. In fact, it still is a Jewish thing. Jews still baptize in a mikvah, right? In a, 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 a pure pool of water, right? So it's still uh, to this day, right? All right. So the, the Hebrew term here uh, for baptism is uh, tevila, right? Uh, and like I said, it's, it's done in a mikvah, which is a pure body of water, right? Could be a lake, a stream, or it could be a contained uh, a container that has pure water. And the one thing that we know is that baptism is always done by full, complete immersion. The Jews do not know any other way to baptize. And in fact, the Bible doesn't describe any other way of being baptized except for full, complete immersion. It knows nothing of sprinkling, nothing of pouring. Yes, Mike. In the movie, the uh, the the show that's going on, the, the chosen, the chosen, yeah, uh, they had an example of that uh, when Peter's wife lost their baby, mm -hmm. and he she went to the rabbi, and yep. she went through a full immersion baptism. For yeah, cleaning, for cleaning. that's right. For it's and again, had nothing to do with sin. That's just a ceremonial cleansing, not related to sin at all. Okay. Now, um, no, 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 it could be like the Jordan River is a, a free flowing just body of water, right? But I mean, you wouldn't want something that's that's uh, like stagnant and and like you know just gross. It's, so, rain water, free flowing water, spring water would typically be uh, what would be used now. The rabbinic writings just to talk about this. So, you know, from again, from a Jewish perspective, and all these people are Jews. John the Baptist is Jew, Jesus is a Jew. So, you know, the church has gotten baptism wrong in most sectors of Christianity. It got it completely wrong because they forgot to ask a Jew what it meant to be baptized, right? And then you forgot to look at the Bible to see what the Bible says. But this is what the rabbinic writings say. It says the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, often speaks of washing or bathing for the purpose of purification. According to Jewish tradition, this washing or bathing means total immersion in a special natural pool of water or a mikvah. The mikvah must contain no less than 40 seyas of water, which is the minimum quantity required for completely covering the body of an adult person of average size. But this applies only to a mikvah formed by a gathering of rainwater. If the water came from under the ground, as in spring or well, it can purify even if it even if its contents are less than 40 seahs, provided it affords complete immersion of the body. So this is the rabbinic rulings on this. And of course, this is exactly what we see in the Bible itself. They're actually following a biblical uh, precedence here for baptism, all right? The other thing, in addition to this ritual cleansing, is that baptism also was this means of, of identification. So there's really kind of two primary things that baptism represented. One of them would be purification for ceremonial uncleanliness. The other one is an identification. People would be baptized to identify with a person, a message, or a group. And by being baptized, when you came out, your identification was changed. Before I was baptized, I was this. And now when I come out, my identification has been changed, right? Okay. 
And the Greek word for uh, baptism is, is uh, bapto, and bapto just means to dip or to die. So anything that you would dip or die was, a ba was bapto, was baptism. So if you're at home and you're washing your dishes after dinner and you stick them in the sink underneath the water, you have baptized your dishes, right? It just means to dip or die. If you've got cloth and you're putting in like a white cloth and you dip it into a dye, complete submersion, you pull it out, You've baptized that cloth. In both cases, the identification of the thing being baptized has changed. You've gone from a dirty dish, immersed it, and it comes out clean. The identification is different. You've taken a white cloth, you've baptized it, it comes out to be a red or purple or whatever color uh, cloth that you want. So it's a change in the identification of the thing being baptized. It could be an inanimate object, or as a person, it's a change in the person's identification, right? So, Prutumam says, hence the basic meaning of the act of baptism is identification with a person and her message and or group. So when John's calling people to be baptized, when they come and they're baptized, they are identifying with John's message. I come out, I'm a disciple of John, and what John says, I'm identifying as that is the thing that I believe. That's what the baptism was to do. It wasn't to save you. It wasn't to, to save your sins. That was your repentance and the sacrifice you would go pay at the temple. That's what would cover your sins. The baptism was you identifying with John's message as being true. Does that make sense? Don't get the baptism confused with the thing that would save them or remove their sins, right? Many areas baptism is no dependence upon a person. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If if you want to be baptized, they will cast you out from their family. Yeah. And eventually, if they can, they will kill you. Yep. Because you have you have done something totally strange from the family standpoint. Yeah, baptism is your your I, I, oh it's your public identification with with Christ. All right. Um, now, <laughs> you might wonder, how do we get this word baptism, and where does some of the confusion come from? So basically, this the term uh, "bapto" means to baptize. Baptizo means immersion. So in other words, bapto means to baptize. Baptizo means the method of baptism is through immersion, right? So this word baptizo or immersion uh, was very common. Like I said, dishes, washing, anytime you would bring something and put it underwater, bring it back out again, that's, you would word, use the word baptizo. I'm immersing X, whatever it is, in water, okay? Now, this is what uh, this is kind of how we get this uh, this word baptism in English. Okay, well the English word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, meaning immersion. It is not per se a natural English term. When the Bible was translated into English, the majority of the church was practicing sprinkling as a means of baptism, and a small minority was practicing pouring. Almost no one was practicing immersion anymore. It would have been embarrassing to translate the Greek word literally as immersion, right? It should have been John the Immerser, right? They were coming to John's immersion, right? That's actually the way it should have been translated in your in our English Bibles, right? It shouldn't be baptism. It should be immersion. And this is what he's saying here. It would have been really awkward for the church to actually translate the Greek word literally as immersion because no one was practicing immersion anymore. Because if you translate as immersion, all of a sudden people start asking the question, wait, I thought a baptism was by sprinkling. Now you're saying that it's immersion. So that's what he's saying here is that they did not translate the Greek word literally. To avoid having to change the church's way of performing the ordinance, the translators chose to transliterate, not translate, but transliterate, rather than translate the word. And so the word baptism was born coming from baptizo. However, the Greek word simply means immersion, even as a ritual baptism began with the Jewish community and along with the Jews, even to this day, the only way of baptizing is by immersion, All right? Okay, um, so again, we've kind of covered this here that since baptism means identification, those who were coming to John's baptism meant that they were agreeing with and identifying with 
John's message. That's the purpose of the baptism. It's not to remove sins. Yes, he was calling them to repent. That would have been repentance and then go to the temple and offer sacrifices for your sins. That's the way that sins were atoned for or covered. It wasn't by baptism, but the baptism identified with you that you said, yes, I understand repentance is needed. Yes, I understand the Messiah is coming. And yes, I have become a disciple of John. Does that make sense? It's an identification. All right. Um, now, don't get this confused with believer's baptism, okay? The baptism of John was for that Jewish generation at that time to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah, right? The, he was baptizing them. Believer's baptism is what we have, and that is we are being baptized into Christ, right? And that baptism isn't to believe the message of what John was preaching before, although that certainly we, we need to believe that. It's to identify ourselves with the burial, death, and resurrection. So when we are baptized, we are identifying with Christ's death and resurrection, not with this one. So the baptisms are different. There's the baptism of John, and there's what's called believer's baptism, which is identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. Yes. There were people that uh, were baptized by John, but then uh, they went back to their uh, where they lived, and they, they never knew who Christ was until Paul came along or uh, some of the apostles, and then they were re-baptized into the believer's baptism. Is That's that right. What that is? That's right. Acts 19. That's right. And that, that's the difference. They had undergone John's baptism, which is we believe that the kingdom is coming. We believe that we need to repent. And we believe that whoever you point out is the Messiah will be the Messiah. But then they left before John was able to point out Christ was the Messiah. So they underwent John's baptism. But then when Paul meets them, he's like, oh, oh hold on a second here. You didn't know that Christ Jesus was actually the Messiah. And then, then they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And then they needed to go undergo the believer's baptism because they're not saved. All right. So all baptism today is believer's baptism. Right. Yes, period. believer's baptism. Yes. There will come a day when baptism is going to be something completely different. Fire. Does, By fire. Yeah. Does, do uh, the Jewish people still practice baptism in their yeah. community? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, so just make, yeah. So that, but that wouldn't be. So no, 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 no. In fact, they wouldn't be. They wouldn't be experiencing John's baptism either, because they didn't. They won't believe John's message because they don't believe the uh, the New Testament. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you have to be uh, a, a Jewish baptism is required uh, if you become a convert to Judaism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they still again they still the Jews still practice it, but it's all by complete uh, immersion. All right. Now here's the question. And if you haven't asked this question, you probably haven't been reading your Bible well enough. But why did Jesus come to be baptized? He didn't just come to say, yeah, 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 John, you, you preach it, John. Preach it, John, and let these people be baptized. Jesus came and said, I want to be baptized. And John said, no, I don't, I'm not going to do that. It's kind of like Peter. Don't wash my feet, Jesus. I should be washing yours. It's the same response, right? So we have to ask our question. Since Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't coming to be baptized as a Gentile proselyte, right? So that's out of the question. He's certainly not uh, coming to be baptized as a means of, of um, identifying that he's repented of his sins, right? So it's not because of any sin. It's not because of that. So why in the world would Jesus come to be baptized, right? That's the question. Oh, Mikey. Yeah, Mikey, go ahead. Do you have a question? You had an answer? To show that he was God because didn't like heaven open once he got baptized well that actually yes that is going you're right you you've nailed one of the one of the reasons but way, way to go way to go nice nice job mikey yeah you taught him well all right um so here's so fruit and mom list six of them i'm just going to read these ones off to you just to give you an idea uh, number one his baptism was to fulfill all righteousness in fact uh, four out of the six that he gives are actually included within the text right his baptism was to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness, by definition, is consistently living with and perfectly conforming to an absolute standard. And the standard at this point was the Mosaic law. By being baptized, the Messiah identified himself with the righteousness of the law, showing that he would fulfill all of its righteous demands. In other words, he would live a sinless life. And we get that from the fact that Jesus says he needs to fulfill all righteousness. 
The second thing is, is to identify with the message. We already talked about this. John has been preaching about the kingdom coming and the need for repentance. Is Jesus being baptized? Because he identifies with the message. Yes, John, what you're preaching is spot on. I agree with that. And by being baptized, I'm committing myself to the message that has been put out there, right? Um, the other thing is that, and we'll get into this later uh, when we get into the temptation of Christ, and that'll be next week. But his baptism publicly identified him to Israel. He was publicly authenticated as the Messiah, both verbally and visibly. And again, Mikey, this is what you're talking about. He comes out of the water and the Holy Spirit is there as well as God the Father. And so there's a confirmation that, in fact, he is the promised uh, Messiah, right? The fourth thing is identify with believers. That Yeah, um, sorry, Joe. Yes. Real quick. Well, what strikes me about this is if you're wondering who he is, God the Father speaks audibly and says, mm -hmm. this is my son. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sure if there were still any Sadducees or Pharisees around, they would be um, that would be uh, not taken well. And in fact, I've got I've got a little comment here coming up about about this. So, but if I can remember, if I can remember to say it, yes, Rich. Or was that something that they knew would happen, that there would be a baptism that would identify the Messiah? No, no. But this was what God chose as the event in which, yes, so as he comes out, the spirit comes down, the voice comes out of heaven. This is the way in which God decided to announce the candidacy, like the president, right, whatever. I mean, this is, this is the opening salvo. Right, that's what it means here. Is that it gives it gives? It's, it's not a private thing, where Jesus all of a sudden says, "Hey, I'm the Messiah." And he's walking around like, "Like, no, look, good." God is actually the one that pronounced it, and so therefore his public ministry can begin because God has ordained it and authorized it. Right? Crazy. Um, crazy. All right. Um, the fourth thing is to be identified with believers. Right. The people that were coming to John's baptism were believers. They're part of the faithful remnant. They understood the need to live righteous and holy lives. John, what do we need to do? And they were being baptized. So by doing that, he identified with the rest of the people that were coming also to say, yes, we are believers in God. The other thing, though, is that he identifies not only with the believing remnant, but he identifies himself with sinners. These people were sinners. Even though he wasn't, he identifies himself with sinners because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, him who knew no sin, right? Again, it's very clear he wasn't being baptized because of a sin. He made himself to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh to be identified with sinners. That's what, that's what Paul says. So at this baptism... He is identifying himself with the rest of the people that are humbling themselves before God and saying, I'm a sinner. I need repentance. The one who knew no sin becomes sin for us, and he identified with us as fallen creatures at the baptism. That's, that's so beautiful because in his whole walk, Jesus never put himself above anyone. Mm -hmm. He was always a servant, but he was God. Mm -hmm. And he could have said, I'm God, and I'm going to destroy everything and everyone. Yeah. But he was always a servant. Yeah, and that's what, that's what Paul talks about. Take that like me. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yes, and that's what, that's what uh, Paul says in Philippians, Never right? He took the form of death, even death on a cross, when humbling himself, right? And, and so Paul's pretty clear that what's going on here is the one who knew no sin says, I, I mean, God entered into human history. He didn't have to do that. How humiliating is it for God to say, I'm going to take on human form and live among my creatures who are sinful? But yeah, he did it because he wanted 
to be like us. He wanted to live his life out perfectly. There's a connection that he provides that's not some distant God. I think we've talked about this before that, that there's, there's kind of these, these concepts of, of God's transcendency and God's intimacy, right? And sometimes we think of, we, we mistakenly fall on one side or the other. When we think of God's transcendency, we think God as being something completely out there that we, we've got no connection to. He's this high and mighty thing. And it's just, you know, he, he's, he's way out there. That's his transcendency. He transcends humankind. That's if you only view God that way, then there's no relationship. God doesn't love you. If you only focus on God's intimacy, how much he loves us and, and whatever else, you turn him into the lapdog, Rich. Thank you. That's a great analogy. He ends up just being your little buddy that's over here. God must be viewed from a both transcendent and an intimate view if we're going to have a proper view of God. Yes, he is intimate. He's also transcendent. And John just showed us that element, right, of this whole thing. So part of what he's doing here is he is identifying himself with us. And incredible. Yeah. Him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf. That's right. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is. Now, um, the other thing is that um, at his baptism, he's going to receive this special anointing by the Holy Spirit, right? In fact, Acts 10.38 says that even Yeshua, that's Jesus, Yeshua, uh, even Yeshua of Nazareth, uh, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So he has received this special anointing of the Holy Spirit that will remain on him for the rest of the entirety of his ministry. So it was also a way of him being empowered to go forth and do what he needed to, to, to uh, have happen. And that might be how he was able to um, disappear at times. Prior to his return to the resurrection, so it, it's it, got yeah. no, yeah, it's it's the Bible doesn't tell us how it could be that God just blinded the people and He just yeah, he, we don't know. I mean, it's always interesting to think about what happened there, but uh, we'll get to some of those. Okay, um, now someone mentioned earlier, I don't I, maybe Joe, I think it was you that said, oh gosh, what we have here at the baptism of Christ is the Trinity. Right, it's there, and of course, that is correct. The Trinity is seen because we have the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and then the voice coming from heaven, which is distinct from the dove, also distinct from Christ. You've got three distinct persons here the voice calling from heaven, the dove upon Christ, and Christ Himself. All right, so obviously, God the Son is present in the person of Jesus Christ. Right, okay, God the Spirit in the form of the dove is is actually a physical appearance. People could see this. This wasn't some ghostly apparition. He took the, the form of this dove and comes down and hovers above a rest on the person of Christ. Now, someone a couple of weeks ago mentioned this idea of the hovering. They said, oh gosh, that reminds me of Genesis, right? I think that, yeah, that might've been you, Jeff. That's exactly, that's exactly what you should be thinking about because the first appearance we have is in the second verse of Genesis right? Where it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, that word for hovering in Hebrew is uh, merhef, sorry, merhefet, get it right, merhefet, um, and it's used of this idea of a bird, a mother bird, who is like, she's got um, her eggs, and before they hatch, she's like, sitting and brooding over the top of them and to protect them, right? So it's this idea of this hovering uh, mother bird, right? And so that's how it really describes the Holy Spirit. He's hovering like a bird over the earth in preparation for it to hatch in the creative power that God is going to unleash. Make sense? All right. Now, this is what the rabbi said. This is the rabbinic writings. And this is, again, why them seeing the dove descend upon him would have meant something really specific to them that it wouldn't have meant to us. I mean, heck, the, you know, the spirit could have come down in the form of a, I don't know, form of a monkey and sat on his shoulder. We would have like, there's, you know, it wouldn't have meant anything to us. But to a Jewish person, there was a special significance to this idea of God's spirit 
being in the form of a dove, right? And so they would have recognized the imagery of there. So this is what the rabbi said. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, Genesis 1-2, like a dove. Now, again, Genesis 1-2 doesn't say anything about a dove. It just says he hovered. But the rabbis took that as the symbol of God, the Holy Spirit, being in the form of a dove in Genesis 1-2. Hovered over the waters like a dove, which hovers over her young without touching them. It has been taught, Rabbi Jose says, I was once traveling on the road, and I entered into one of the ruins of Jerusalem in order to pray. Elijah of blessed memory appeared and waited for me at the entrance until I had finished my prayer. After I finished my prayer, he said to me, my son, what sound do you hear in this room? I heard a divine voice, bought coal, cooing like a dove and saying, woe to the children on account of whose sins I destroyed my house and my burnt and burnt my temple and exiled them among the nations of the world. And he said to me, by your life and by your head, not in this moment alone does it so exclaim, but thrice each day does it proclaim thus. So what we get here is we get this, this rabbinic legend, right? This rabbi said, that, hey, one time I was walking by Jerusalem and uh, it was in ruins and I went in to pray and all of a sudden Elijah appears to me and Elijah asked me, what do you hear? He's like, I, I hear a cooing like a dove. Well, what's the what's the dove saying? Oh, and then so this is what the dove says. I destroyed my house and my temple because of all the sins you guys did, essentially. So this idea the rabbis have of the, the Holy Spirit coming in this form of a dove was very common imagery for them. So seeing the Holy Spirit come down like a dove would have immediately evoked the idea of the Holy Spirit to the Jewish people in a way that you and I probably would be like, I don't know, looks like a dove, I guess, right? Um now, the third person of the Trinity also shows up, right? And that is God the Father. So we've got this dove that's resting and hovering over Christ. And then we've got this voice that calls out out of heaven, right? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now, this voice out of heaven is what um, uh, the uh, rabbis called the, the bat kol, right? And it's spelled a couple different ways there. Um, but it literally means a daughter of a voice. And what they mean by that is an echo. Like if you've ever heard your voice echo, you're, the, the actual speaking is louder and more distinct. And then the echo gets echo, gets echo, gets right. So it's it, the daughter of a voice is what's meant by this, this voice that kind of came out of heaven. So it literally means daughter of a voice. And it means a reverberating sound or a voice descending from heaven uh, to offer guidance in human affairs. Now, they did, the rabbis did regard it as a little bit lower in prophecy than what was delivered by the prophets, right? So they had some interesting ideas about it, but they did believe that the Bach Kol was the Holy Spirit, right? This is what they believed. So um, in the Targum, uh, again, this is the Jewish writings, it says, in later Judaism, one manner of revelation was through the Bach Kol, a heavenly voice, literally daughter of a voice or an echo. In a sense, the Bach Kol was the same as the Holy Spirit, God revealing his will to man, or as a continuing divine action after the Holy Spirit was believed to have ceased to be with Israel. After the death of the last prophets, the Holy Spirit was taken up from Israel, but the people still made use of the Bach Kol. Now, what it's being said here is that the rabbis taught that after Malachi, God's Holy Spirit left the earth. That's why there's no more prophets. God's Holy Spirit is left. There's the, 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 so he's not speaking to the prophets anymore. But what they did say is that the prophetic voice would return once Elijah comes back to inaugurate the Messianic kingdom. So between Malachi and Elijah, there wasn't going to be more, any more prophets. That's what the rabbis taught. However, they did say that even though the Holy Spirit has been taken up away from the earth and is not speaking to the prophets, occasionally God still speaks in an audible voice to his people. He hasn't left his people completely in the dark. He just doesn't speak through prophets. So again, that's the Bach Kol. That's this, this voice coming out of heaven. So again, the, the rabbi said, this is just a quote um, from the Midrash, Rabbah. It says, it has been taught with the death of the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the Holy Spirit departed Israel, but still the Bach Kol was available to them, the Jewish people. So as they're watching the scene, Jesus comes up out of the water. This dove descends, representing the Holy Spirit, 
And then they hear the bot coal, the voice out of heaven, okay, representing God speaking directly to hey, I them. Have a question regarding that. You can pose any question you want. Uh, the Bible says that um, when he came up out of the water, he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove mm -hmm. and settling on him. Mm -hmm. So, did everybody see this then? Yeah, it seems did like yes. To hear this when God was saying it, we don't have any indication that they did not. Um, that said, they did not. A voice from heaven said, "This is my dear." It doesn't it? Didn't say that he heard that. Yeah, it just said that a voice from heaven. And again, I think it's just telling from John the Baptist's perspective. He baptizes them, and as he's coming up, because John's going to later on here um, in um, to, uh, three weeks from now or two weeks from now. John's going to come back and say that the identification of Christ as the Messiah is because he saw this happen. So he's speaking at it as from John the Baptist's perspective, because it was important to him that he correctly identify the Messiah. And it came, the identification of the Messiah came to John the Baptist because of this event. So that's going to be in a couple of weeks. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, uh, so we've got this voice out of heaven, and that's God the Father. So remember the Shekinah glory, we've talked about that in the past. That's God's visible manifestation. And in this case, the visible manifestation was what? The, the No, that's that's audible. Vis what's the visible? The dove. That's right, the dove. So we have here in this instance the Shekinah glory in the form of the dove, but we also have the auditory presence of God through the bot coal, right? So we have this unique situation uh, that we have here. Now, as part of this, God says, God says this about Jesus. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So, so God is then affirming that Jesus is his unique son. Now, we're, we're used to hearing like, you're sons of God. We're all sons of God. Every human being is a son of God, blah, 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 whatever else. To the Jewish people, they didn't talk about him as my, a unique son. Israel was God's son. But remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. This is why Christ gets himself in the trouble, because he claims to be God's unique son. And they're like, whoa, 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 you can't do that, because that means you're God. If you're God's son, like unique son, you're God. But God says this, this is my beloved son, talking specifically about an individual, not about a nation or a group of people. And this, this then is a fulfillment of Psalm 212, where the psalmist says, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, the language here, his wrath is quickly kindled, reminds you of what? The chosen. Not the chosen. No, not the chosen. Not the chosen. Not the chosen. Not the chosen. His wrath is quickly kindled, reminds you of what? We just learned it tonight. John previously said what? No, he didn't say God so loved the world. Not tonight. What did he say earlier? Fire. The fire. Kiss the sun, lest his wrath is quickly kindled. In other words, this aligns right with what John's been talking about. You better pay homage to the sun and accept him, because if you don't, the sun's wrath is quickly kindled 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 like a flame and you're going to burn right that's exactly what is going on here yeah, in this one was that oh yeah 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 uh, well it, here's here's the one thing i was going to say that the, in the rabbinic writings they believe that their writings were superior to god yes and what they would say is that if the rabbinic writings, even if God would call to them out of heaven and say, no, what you have written here is not correct, they would say that can't be the case because God is subject to our laws. And I won't get into now. I'm going to get into this a little bit later on and show you the rabbinic quotes of what that means. So they even would say, even if we hear a voice out of heaven that says something that contradicts our Pharisaic doctrine, the voice is wrong. That's what would have been happening here. Like, even the voice calling, like, what would God do? What would God have to do to get a Pharisee's attention? Nothing. 
There's nothing he could do if it contradicted their religious beliefs. There was an ending God could do. Look at all the miracles Christ did. Guess what? It didn't change the Pharisees as a group, right? Okay. Um, it God uh, uh, declared that Jesus was, uh, that he's very pleased with Jesus. Uh, and by doing this, he has commissioned him now to go out and fulfill the role of the Messiah. Now, this is one of three times in the gospel accounts that we have this, um, this, voice coming out from heaven where God confirms Christ as his son and his pleasure with him. So this is the first of three. Then we're going to end here tonight. Uh, I know we're a few minutes over, but um, bear with me just for a second. So Luke then ends this section. He says, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, son of Heli. Now, let me just ask you a question. If you were here back in session two or three or the, whichever the genealogy one, not even three or four, I can't remember. Do you remember this verse? Anyone remember that? Yes. This is what we talked about. That's right. So as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli, well, Mary is the daughter of, of uh, Mary is the daughter here, says as supposed was. Now what's going to happen here, if you went and read, read Luke 3, 24 onward, that's where you get Luke's genealogy. So Luke presents Christ as the Messiah first, and then he gives the account of Christ's birth through Mary, right? And so Whereas Matthew deals with it in Matthew chapter one, right out of the gate, Matthew deals with the genealogy and the birth of Christ. Luke actually gets to the genealogy part right here, right? That Jesus began his ministry and then he gives this genealogy to explain it. So um, that's kind of, if you read the rest of Luke uh, chapter three, that's what you're going to see is this genealogy. All right, now, skip ahead very quickly. Notice Luke says that he was about 30 years of age. Doesn't say he was 30. Says he's about 30. So this is a general number that Luke is throwing out there. Now, if Jesus's ministry started in 27 AD, remember I, I talked about that the crucifixion could have happened in one of two different time periods, right? Depending on when Caesar Augustus was emperor in uh, Tiberius, right? So this identification so if jesus ministry started the early date would have been like 27 a.d when his ministry started if that's the case then jesus would have been about 33 or 34 years old when he started his ministry because remember he was born probably in between 7 and 6 bc so if it's 27 a.d you add 6 to 7 to that and you're going to get he's about 33 34 right somewhere around there if Jesus' ministry started in about 29 or 30 AD, putting the crucifixion at like 33 AD, then he was around 36 or 37, and his death would occur when he would be like 40. Does that make sense? So he's about 30 years of age. Now, some people have taken the about 30 versus it being, you know, older, would have been about 40 maybe. They've taken it to mean that this first date the early crucifixion date of 8030 might be more likely. But again, that's that's really just conjecture because Luke's only given us an approximation of his age, not an exact date. And you have to be 30 years old. Yeah, there's there's the the and we're gonna actually we're actually yes. Yeah, and that's that's that whichever one, either the early date or the later date, he's at least over 30 years old for either one of those, those two. Yeah, and we'll get to some of the the um qualifications of that when we get into his uh, interaction with Nicodemus later on. That, and that's why I was saying about uh, uh, when you were showing uh, Psalms 212 there. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite scene of all the chosen when Jesus and Nicodemus were together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they said that verse together mm -hmm. to one another. That's right. And it just, I, I, bro I broke down crying listening to it and watching that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just I just uh, rewatched that one again. It's, this is actually very, very stirring. Very, very stirring. So we're now, guess what? We are now into the, the life of the Messiah. If what you mean by the life of Messiah, by actually watching him 
act and talk. Like we've now, we've moved into that now. The rest of it is going to be Christ, the things he says, the things he does, the miracles he does. And I'm actually really thankful because the preparatory stuff, super important, but I love hearing him talk. Like this is God talking when he talks watching him do his work, watching him with compassion as he has compassion on people. Like those things are stirring. Like you said, his, his, his encounter with Nicodemus as they portrayed it, very stirring uh, what Christ does. So we're going to move into that in the next little bit. Now, our next section for next week is going to be the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. So this is going to be great. You don't want to miss it. Um, here's what's going to happen just very quickly. I'll, do, I'll mention this again next week, and I'll give you some more info. Um, I'm going to be teaching next week, and then I'm off to Zimbabwe for a couple of weeks to teach at a couple of seminaries there, right? So I will be gone, but my brother, who is getting his master's in Messianic Jewish studies, is very well acquainted with this material. He will actually be teaching remotely on the 1st. Now, we won't be meeting here on the 1st. It'll all be remote because I don't want to have anyone have to deal with all the setup and the tech issues. I don't want that to be an issue. So that'll be completely remote, but he will be teaching while I'm over there in uh, Zimbabwe. And then we won't be meeting on the 8th or the 15th. And then we'll meet on the 22nd again. So it'll be like two weeks where we won't have anything going on at that time. All right. So that's kind of just the, uh, the public service announcement going forward. Okay. Any questions that we have for um, this evening? Any comments? Yeah, uh, we got lots. Okay, here we go. Yeah, Mike. I had made an observation uh, in last week's study. We were talking about uh, John the Baptist and the clothes he wore and the food he ate. And Matthew was talking about uh, his clothes and, and, and whatnot. And then this week we, we talked about the Pharisees, the Sadducees coming out to observe. And um, in and, and Matthew, uh, in Matthew 3, 7, when... Uh, when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, after describing his his uh, clothes and what he wore, uh, after he saw the, the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed. Mm -hmm. So we go over to Luke, and Luke talks about the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius and Pontius Pilate and Herod and uh, Annas and Caiaphas. And he, he, gave, he gave us a really pretty picture of the time frame uh, when Jesus or when John the Baptist was doing what he was doing. And then he talked about real briefly here, um, uh, uh, Isaiah, where he was the voice in the desert. And then immediately he goes into when the crowds came to john for baptism he said you brood of vipers so the crowds weren't they just the general people that were coming out there he didn't make any mention of that he just said when the people came he was calling everybody a brood of vipers he wasn't we talked about, we talked about that last week we talked about last week that what you have here is you have in luke this general thing where he says you brood of vipers and we have to read Matthew's account to realize that he was saying that directly to the Pharisees and Sadducees, not to the general crowd. Cause there was the crowd that was coming to him for baptism. He wants them to come. He, he, he says, who warned you talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees to repent and to flee the wrath that's to come. It's the people that are coming to him. He wants them to be baptized. So he's not calling them, but you have to take both into account. So that, so the, uh, the Pharisees and, and, and you know, we call them, the Sanhedrin, right, which yeah. is the group of, of those people, um, he, uh, they were invoking um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that we don't need your baptism. Mm -hmm. We have this over here. So they were denying Christ. And, and so my, I guess my point, my question is, is all of those people are dead. Are they going to be burned in the lake of fire for eternity then? They will be thrown into lake of fire to be destroyed. To be destroyed. Yes. Yes. I mean, all, all unbelievers from all periods of time will be thrown into lake of fire to be destroyed. Not just them, but all of them. Yeah. So that's Joe. what I was going to conclude. You already said it, but for me, the application of all this, 
is just what you said. So unbelievers are going to go into the fire. We need to reach them. Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah. Now, by the, by the way, just, just you're touching on a little bit of a point, and I was trying to be very clear on my perspective that they'll go into Lake Fire to be destroyed. Yeah, so when, so yeah. we, I'm going to do, well, like I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do a, a two part as part of this, a, a two sessions on the doctrine of hell so that we can act because this is anyway, I won't get into it, but there's two sessions coming up where we're going to actually dig into this whole idea and uh, get into that more. So yes, Rich. Well, whenever I hear uh, in, in your courses, Randall, when, you know, we were studying the Old Testament and talking about hell and God's wrath and <clears throat> the fire and people being destroyed and, you know, eternity and the lake of fire, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard not to have a sense of dread about that. You know, and then I was looking at that verse in Corinthians that you mentioned in your slide, and it, it said, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, but he said, for our sake, he did that, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. He did that for our sake. Yep. For our sake. Yeah. And we don't even just... For, for him... Well, I mean, I find that a little, you know, hard to comprehend. And sometimes you read little words like that for our sake and you just breeze right through them. But it says for our sake. And when you, you know, to me, when I think and hear of all these things about hell and destruction, and fire and death and eternity, for our sake, he did that for us so that mm -hmm. we might become the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's that's we the whole, be dancing in the street, yeah. boy. Should be. <laughs> Serious, be, because of, of the, the alternative. Yeah. Yeah. The the alternative isn't isn't um, it's not pretty. And uh, but he warns us. All mankind knows, right? I mean, we can go into what Paul says in Romans chapter one, verses uh, eighteen through twenty yeah. specifically, but. Um, but he also demonstrates his love that while we were yet sinners. So that's just goes back to, he did for our sake. He didn't do for, I mean, he didn't do for his sake. I mean, he had to die. I mean, there's nothing, he, he didn't get anything out of it other than the fact that he's receives glory for, you know, his it's saving right, work. But longer. yeah. Uh, any other comments or questions? Stuff. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to end then with just a, um, uh, not a, I'm not going to pray. I'm going to actually just read out of Romans chapter six. What's that? Yes. Romans chapter six. It's in the uh, the Christian Bible, not the other Bible that you're reading there, Rich. The Christian one. <laughs> okay. In case you, okay. Romans. <laughs> hey, sorry. You know. <laughs> so what page is that on? <laughs> All right, no. Okay, so so this is what it says. Okay, it says this. It says, what sh this is Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried... Therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a re resurrection like his. I'll just stop there. We talked about baptism tonight, and Paul is just saying, look, we've been baptized into Christ. This is a believer's baptism. Just as Christ is pictured as going under in death, Paul goes on to say that our old self, we are to consider it dead. And that's the picture of what happens when we're saved. Our identification has changed. I just what I wanted to come back to. Our identification has changed. We are identified before we go in as being those who are objects of God's wrath. We then go under in baptism and we come up 
It is identification with the life that Christ had as he came up out of the, the tomb. And Paul says, look, if we died in the manner that Christ died, in other words, we died to sin, but Christ died and was put in the grave. If his resurrection resulted in his life, this is what he says, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And we've been united with him in a death like this. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Our identification has changed. We're no longer objects of wrath. We're objects of God's love and joy, sonship. And he is the first fruits of eternal life. So you're right. We should be dancing. I don't know. We should be dancing in the streets because of that. But this is that connection to the idea of baptism as an identification. Our old life, we are now identified as something new. We are new creatures, right? Yeah, we are sons of God. We have we have inheritance. That's right. All right. Well, thank you. Anyone online have anything before we close out? All right. Well, if not, then we will see you next week. Um, read The Temptation of Christ in the Wilderness uh, by Satan. And then uh, that will be a really nice introduction to what Christ is trying to accomplish through his ministry. So I will see you all next week. Uh, thank you, Randy.